Ready to go? Are we live? Okay. I uh, want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, I'm Eric Cortinas. I'm with the Building Department of the City of Fairhope. Um, we'd like to thank Chris Bryant. He is uh, an independent insurance adjuster. He contacted us uh, a week or so ago and had started talking to us about all of the things that he's seeing and talking with, with homeowners who are having issues understanding or struggling with their insurance claims and their insurance companies. And he suggested that we do this and we're very thankful that he he brought this to us and gave us the opportunity to do it. We also miss Jessica Sawyer who has organized everything for us and, and gotten everything squared away, excuse me. Sorry, uh, got everything organized for us. We want to thank Cliff Pittman. He's with us tonight. Uh, he is the president of the Baldwin County Home Builders Association. And um, so we're gonna go on ahead and get started. But what we're doing tonight is a, is a virtual town hall. We each have a section that we're gonna talk about. Can they see the PowerPoint too? Okay. Okay, we have a PowerPoint presentation that we're gonna do. And uh, each of us are gonna carry a, a certain section and talk about some different things. Um, and so we're going to kind of break it up. The, the topics that we're going to cover tonight, uh, first is how the insurance claim process works. And Chris is going to talk about that. And there's some bullet points that he's going to go through about things you can do to, to address your, your questions and concerns with your insurance company. And then I'm going to discuss, um, building code requirements for your repairs. Uh, I'm also going to touch on contractor licensing because the, both the city of Fairhope and the state of Alabama have very specific licensing laws for different kinds of work. Uh, I'm also going to briefly go over because I've had a lot of conversations with the Small Business Administration and that's probably the biggest item we're going to cover tonight are some very hard deadlines that folks have for applying for their SBA loans for their rebuild. And then Cliff's going to come up and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, local contractors and resources that you can use to find contractors. And there's also a lot of things going on in the construction industry. Right now it's a very busy time even without the storm damage and the rebuild work that's going on. And so there's material issues that are going on about availability of material. There's uh, issues with the cost of material going up and down and just scheduling things because contractors were busy before this ever happened and now that's just, you know, squared and cubed. So uh, we want to make sure everybody kind of understands what you need to be having patience and the things you need to be looking for when you're dealing with a contractor. So we're going to go on ahead and get started and I'm going to ask Chris to come up and kind of go through his, uh, information on the claims process. At the end of this, uh, we had some questions that were emailed in to us. We're going to address those questions. And Jessica, am I correct that if any come in during, we'll, we'll be able to field some questions that may come in on the Facebook feed um, and, and the YouTube comments as they come in. So if you have questions, please make those in comments. They will get to us. Uh, we're, we're dedicated for an hour. If we, if we get everything taken care of and everybody's happy after 45 minutes or 50 minutes, we'll go on ahead and wrap it up. Uh, but we're going to do our best to address your questions. But I'm going to turn it over to Chris and we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, Eric. So the purpose of me putting this meeting together was to make sure that people in our area understood the claims process and how it works. And so many people don't realize that because right, it's been nearly 15 years since we had a major storm. And <clears throat> as a result of that, one of the main things we run into as an adjuster is we find that many people do not understand their policy. We get it every year, we sign it, we renew it, and we keep moving forward. And until there's a major event, a lot of times people do not actually read and go over their policy and understand exactly what it means. So if you have a chance, get with your agent or someone that is familiar with the policy and the procedures and the wording, make sure um, you understand what's going on with it. One of the main things to do after you've had a claim is to take plenty of pictures. These days we all have digital cameras and digital phones, so that's an easy process to do. And you can never have too many pictures. Pictures can be easily erased, so that's something you can't have too many of. Also, after the um, 
storm has taken place, one of the things you want to do is secure your property and make sure it's safe. One of the ways to do that is tarping. As many of you know, we can go all over town and see the blue roofs. And also just taking your personal property and securing it and making sure it's safe. You know, you may need to move it to another building, to another room, or even rent storage to put it in. One of the quickest things you need to do after your policy, or after the claim is filed, is contact your agent and start, make, start noting and taking down any um, of the damages that, are, that you see, because so many times people do not realize what all has taken place. And the more you can document, the better you'll be as you move forward through the claims process. I'm going through all my notes here, so sorry, work with me a little bit. There is a lot of paperwork involved with the claims process, and that is where it is, a lot of times it is a good idea to have someone like a good license adju adjuster who you can speak with, or even a contractor to help you ne negotiate and move through it, because there's a lot of paperwork involved, there's a lot of wording in your contracts and in your policy that's hard to understand and a lot of it is repetitive so you have to make sure you understand and go through it properly. One of the things we usually suggest is getting three estimates and the reason for getting those estimates is to make sure that your pricing is fair, to make sure that the insurance company has covered everything. A good licensed contractor will come out and go over all the damages and they're going to look for everything. You, and sometimes that what happens is you might have an adjuster comes out who is newer or there's a lot to see and they may just miss something. So you have to go back and point it out, take pictures and document and send it in for them. One question that comes up often is what happens if the estimate you get from your contract or from your insurance company is different than what you get from the contractor. Well, that's where you can go to the reinspections. You can call your call your insurance agent and ask them to give you a reinspection. And what they may do, especially right now with COVID and everything taking place, they will often ask that you have your contractor take pictures, write up an estimate, and then send it in so that you can they can evaluate it and then see what the differences are. Sometimes they will send an adjuster back out, but as busy as they are right now, it is more often that you're going to they're going to ask for a supplement. If you have a dispute, one of the things you can do when asking for the reinspection is ask that either another adjuster come out and do the reinspection or have a supervisor come out with your original adjuster. This is commonly done throughout the insurance process and it's done on a daily basis. If you cannot read a, reach a common ground at that point, then you can always go forward with the appraisal process. And with the appraisal process, you will hire an appraiser to act on your behalf the insurance company will also hire an appraiser and then they, you'll, they will hire a mutual umpire to go over and mediate the process and come to a settlement. In some cases what we see is a claim is totally denied and a lot of people have, don't understand why and a lot of times it comes from what I said earlier about people not understanding or reading through the claim, through their policy and understanding it entirely. Another good place to go to is to your agent. Let them review it and go over it with you and make sure everything is to your understanding and to your liking. Something we, also, we often run into is people say, well, they sent me a check and it's not the amount that I agreed to or what I thought I should get, so what do I do now? First thing I'm going to say is to put that check in the bank. They're not going to take it back. It doesn't mean that you've agreed and settled on anything, 
but more often times than not I've had people lose a check and then you go through the process of trying to get another one issued to replace it. And then something we've run into and something we've seen is people don't understand their deductibles and actually how they work. So that's the amount that you agree to pay for or you're part of the um, settlement for your claim. One of the things we run into is contractors are often going out and offering, offering to not make you pay that deductible. And that is insurance fraud in the state of Alabama. They cannot do that. You have to pay your deductible. In the state of Alabama, you have up to two years to file claims related to the initial claim. So you can go back and have, find more damages later as your work's being done. Right now, because of the contractors are wide open, they do not, we do not have people that can get it done. You know, a lot of people are gonna be six months out before they even get started. And that gives by having two years, you get you have additional time to find those additional damages and file for them. Something we also see is the insurance company also puts the mortgage company's name on the check. And that's a normal procedure because often your mortgage company has a, a vested interest in the property because they actually own the property until you've paid it in full. Also, people often ask how should they go about handling paying their contractors. What I've always suggested is them pay it in thirds at a time. If it's just a roof, usually you give them a third of the money up front, that'll get you the materials on site. Then once the materials are dropped and your roof's about to be put on, go ahead and pay the contractor another third, and then pay the final third after the roof is finished. But never pay it all up front. And that's pretty much all of mine. Chris, thank you for that. And I will tell you Thursday morning, I will be depositing my check. I've been holding on to my check because I'm, like a lot of other people, I'm learning this. I've never made an insurance claim before. Um, so I've been holding on to that check and my wife's been asking me about it. I know where it is, but uh, I've been worried that that locks me into what the insurance company had offered and I'm glad that's clarified. So I'm going to go on ahead and deposit that check come first thing Thursday morning. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, code requirements and contractor licensing. And there's some additional information and also so you know, when we get done tonight, there's some information that Chris has. There's some, uh, this PowerPoint presentation that I'm about to show you. Uh, also some information from the SBA will be posted to the city's website. As you go open the website, there's a Hurricane Sally tab. If you click that tab, there's like four folders underneath it and you can go through them. One of them is uh, repairing your home and dealing with contractors. They'll be listed under that tab so that you can go back and uh, so you can find that information. Now, tomorrow is a holiday, so we will be posting that uh, first thing Thursday morning or early Thursday morning, getting that done. Um, but I'm gonna go on ahead and talk about code requirements and contractor licensing. So, a couple of things that folks need to be, and, and so you also know, on that tab, there is a handout, you'll see Fairhope roofing requirements. There's a handout that we put together very shortly after the storm to clarify what the roofing requirements are in the city of Fairhope. Um, back right after Hurricane Ivan or Katrina, Baldwin County as a, all of the jurisdictions in Baldwin County passed what they call the Baldwin County High Wind Supplement. And there were roofing requirements that went into that. And I'm gonna tie one thing Chris had said, um, when you get your information from your insurance company, look at that roofing section. Uh, one of the things that, Felt paper, which is a standard for years that you put underneath the shingles on the decking, that was an industry standard for years. Felt is not allowed in Baldwin County. You cannot use it for a roofing underlayment anywhere in Baldwin County, in any jurisdiction, okay? 
But the requirements that we have, um, and I'll get into it a little bit later, each jurisdiction's a little bit different how they distinguish it. What we did in Fairhope was we classified roof damage as either um, distributed or isolated. So if it is distributed roof damage, then that is requiring an entirely new roof. And I've got some photos I'll show you to kind of explain that. But that is essentially they have to strip the roof all the way down to the wood decking. They have to re-nail or verify that the nailing on that decking is no more than four inches apart on the edges and six inches apart in the field at the intermediate rafters. They have to tape the seams of the decking, and the purpose of that is to try to prevent water intrusion from working down through those seams, even if the shingles were to come off. Then they put down an ice and water shield or a waterproofing membrane or synthetic underlayment. And then the shingle type that we require per the manufacturer's specifications is a class H, as in Hilo. That is a class H high wind shingle. That'll, that'll go up to 150 miles an hour. So those are our roofing requirements. Now a couple of the things, as I mentioned, uh, if it's distributed damage, we require a full roof replacement. If it's localized damage, which is one square or less, which is essentially a 10 by 10 area, I've kind of talked to a couple of folks because they have an area that's about 10 by 12. We'll work with them on that. But if it's localized damage, they can repair just that area. Typically, that's from the impact of an object hitting that roof. So a tree hit a corner of the house, they can fix that area as long as they don't have widespread damage through the rest of the shingles. The photos, and they're seeing the photos, Joe? Is that correct? Okay, so those are examples of distributed damage. Um, that is all the way around the house, stuff missing all the way around the house. Those are also older roofs. Um, the, the granular cut, the top of the roof, if you walk on those roofs, the grains come off. I mean, it's, it's, they're in, they need to be replaced. So in that instance, those would be stripped all the way down to the decking, renailed, seams taped, uh, underlayment or waterproofing, and then reshingled. Those are examples that we've seen of localized roof damage where it's in a specific area. And in those instances, we will allow them to come back and repair just those areas as long as we don't have distributed damage and missing, missing shingles kind of hopscotch throughout the roof. What you should look for when your roof is being redone, these are the photos that we require of the contractor with a roofing permit. The one on the left is showing the nailing pattern. Someone put a tape measure out and they showed where the nail holes are so we can verify it's, it's at least no more than four inches on the edge. The photo on the right shows the taping of the seams. That's the waterproofing that you're trying to keep water out of the building. It's what is referred to as a sealed roof deck. Then these are the photos where they have put their ice and water shield or underlayment down on the left, and that is they, they actually added the photo of the starter strip for their shingles on the right hand side. So these are the kind of things, when you're seeing your roof be redone, these are the kind of things you need to be looking for. Be sure and look for the tape on the seams, and especially the photo on the left showing the waterproofing of the roof. The reason we require this is, you know, a lot of people have heard of the Fortified program. It's a big deal here for a lot of years. Fair, Fairhope led the entire nation, regardless of size, in the number of fortified structures in town. The reason for that is several years ago, the Alabama uh, Insurance Commissioner mandated that if you meet the requirements of the Fortified Program, there are mandatory insurance reductions that have to be applied to that. And I've always loved it because for years we have building code requirements that drive up the cost of the work. This is finally something tangible that people have that is a payback for what they're spending and what they're doing. So for roofs, which is bronze, they have three levels, gold, silver, bronze. You're not gonna get a gold unless it's basically a ground up new construction because you've got to look at a lot of different components. But silver, if you have windows that meet the requirements for pressure, the doors and your roof, that is a mandatory 35 to 45% discount on your wind insurance. A roof only is 20 to 35%. Now understand under the Fortified program, to get the certificate, you have to engage a third party Fortified evaluator. They will not take or accept the municipal inspections that our department does. So we'll, and at the bottom of that slide, you'll see Fortified evaluators. There's a link there where you can go and find out the companies 
that are local that are that are fortified evaluators. It's probably an extra five, six, seven hundred dollars. But if you look at the cost of your insurance reduction over the life of that roof, it more than pays for itself. And it also gives you a better roof. So we would strongly encourage folks to take advantage of the fortified program. I will be when I'm redoing my roof here as soon as I can get it done. Uh, real quickly, what kind, and I get this question a lot, what work requires a permit and what does not? Uh, our city council, right after the storm, uh, made a decision that the city is not going to charge for permits to re-roof structures for storm damage or repairing electrical services on a house that were damaged. We do issue a permit. It is a no charge permit. Two reasons for that. One, it creates a file and a paper trail for the work that's being done. And number two, we also verify the licensing of any contractors who come into the office. So there is a permit required. There is no charge for that permit, but you do need to come get it. Um, the kind of work that we do that are that needs will require a permit are structural damage and repairs obviously um, if you're having to remove and replace a substantial amount of drywall that might have gotten wet or water damage we need a permit for that flood damage if you're repairing or replacing electrical mechanical or plumbing components absolutely a permit if you're having to replace windows because there are specific window requirements that need to be met um, Replacing decks and stairs because slips, trips, and falls on stairs is the number one most litigated thing in any house. We want to make sure those stair rise and runs are right. Uh, the roofing repairs, once again, if you have to replace the entire garage door, uh, we need a permit for that because there are wind loading requirements that we want to verify are being met with that garage door. That also ties back to fortified. If you don't have a wind loaded garage door, you are not going to be able to get a fortified designation. Uh, fencing repairs, the only time we issue any permits for fencing repairs are if you are in the city of Fairhope city limits. Uh, there are zoning requirements about types of fences and sizes of fences, so we do need permits for that. If you're in the unzoned county, there are no permitting requirements. If you're in the zone county, then check with Baldwin County Planning and Zoning. And I, I put in all caps, all generator installations. We are having a lot of things coming up with generator installations. And gas piping and locations of generators near openable windows where you can exhaust back in. It is very important if you get a generator installed, please make sure your contractor has a permit and we come look at it. We are here for your safety and that's our overriding concern with the generators. Uh, if you're repairing a garage door and not replacing it, you don't have to have a permit. For any kind of paint, we don't require permits. Uh, if you have exterior trim for gutters or fascia or soffits that were damaged, we're not going to require a permit. And if it's interior drywall repair where you're cutting and patching, then we're not going to require a permit for that. We're not going to come inspect it. Uh, for contractor licensing, real quickly, um, all contractors working in this area should have a City of Fairhope business license. If it's a commercial property and the project is greater than $50,000 in value, they are required to have an Alabama general contractor's license. And I want to make sure, because we have people that moved here from other states. In Alabama, there are different, a general contractor and a home builder are two different things. We have separate licensing boards and requirements. So residential is a home builder. Commercial is a general contractor. If someone comes to repair your house and they tell you they're a state licensed general contractor, they're not licensed to do that work. They have to be a home builder. For a residential project, anything greater than $10,000 requires an Alabama licensed home builder. If it's a residential roof over $2,500 in value, the home builders board also has a roofing license subcategory, okay? And so if it's residential work over 10,000, it's got to be a full unlimited home builder. If it's a roof, then they have to at least have the home builder's roofing license. These are the cards you need to look for. If someone comes to your house to do this work, tell them, I would like to see your state card. The white back state card at the top is the unlimited license. They can do anything. They can do roofs, they can do full renovations, whatever they need. If it's strictly a roof, look for the red backed card. That is their roofer's license. 
Uh, we want to make sure that you're getting what you're supposed to be getting and that these people are properly insured, licensed, and bonded. Um, if dealing with contractors, a couple of things, and I get this question a lot, if a contractor asks you to go get permits or seems unwilling to go get permits, you should ask them why. Um, that's not always, there are some contractors that do let their homeowners do it, but I am always leery of a contractor who does not want to come into the office and get a permit. Um, also, as Chris mentioned, require that you get written contracts and estimates. If it's a contractor from out of town, check their state licensing boards and check their references. We have a lot of contractors coming into town right now. That does not mean just because they're not local that they're not good contractors. We have some good ones that are coming in to do work, but you need to check their references. They could very well be very qualified and do good work, but since they're not local, we're really not going to know them. Ask them for references and check their references. Um, one of the big benefits for permits uh, is to allow documentation of a project. We get calls all the time from insurance companies wanting copies of inspection records, copies of permits on houses that are just selling, houses that are being refinanced. Um, that's a that's it's a big deal because it is a legal written record of your project and that it was done in accordance with the law so please make sure that any work you're getting done has proper permits per the list i just gave you one thing i will also say tree contractors because i get this call a lot there are no state licensing requirements for tree removal contractors as long as they have a valid city business license they're legal to do business what they charge and how they charge is really up to the contractor. I've reached out to a couple of guys to try to see, can you give me a per linear foot estimated cost? And they said, it's very hard to do that. It's based on the size of the tree, the location of the tree. Do they need a crane? Can they get it from the ground? So it's really, tree contractors are, are really a contractual issue between the owner and the contractor. So, but the only licenses that they are required to have <clears throat> per state law is a city license and that's a local ordinance. These contacts uh, are your home builders licensure board, the website. You can go and look up the licensing information of a contractor. Um, they are updating it constantly with new roofing licenses so it may be a little out of date. You're welcome to contact us at the building department and we'll be happy to help you look for it. Uh, the, also, I have the contact info for the uh, Alabama Board of Heating, Air Conditioning, and Refrigeration Contractors and the Alabama Electrical Contractors Board. If you don't hear anything else we say tonight, this is the one thing I want to drive home with as many exclamation points as I can. <clears throat> the Small Business Administration, the SBA, is the organization that handles loans for disaster relief. FEMA has disaster funds and the SBA handles loans. FEMA's disaster funds are geared for people that have lost everything. Their house is gone, their clothes are gone, they have nothing. That's where the FEMA disaster money typically comes into play are for people that are in very dire circumstances and have nothing and nowhere to go. That's where FEMA comes in. If it's repairing your house, you will be directed by the FEMA site to the Small Business Administration. And don't let the name, if you've never dealt with them, don't let the name deceive you. They also do loans for renters and homeowners for these kinds of disaster recoveries, okay? But the deadline for applying for an SBA loan for rebuild for Hurricane Sally is November 19th, which I believe is next Friday, is that correct? That is a hard deadline. If you do not have an application into them by Thursday, Thursday excuse me, it's Thursday. Thursday. Okay, Thursday night. If you do not have, if you need to get a small business loan to have the funds to repair your home and your application is not in on November 19th, you are on your own. That is the, that is, or you will have to go to a private lender to get your loan. So please understand, and I, we've, uh, both Jessica and I have had several conversations with SBA representatives. That is a very important deadline. We're coming up on, I guess it's roughly 60 days past the storm would be what it would be. So we're going to talk about that, but you can go to the website on there. It's Disaster Loan Assistance, 
sba.gov. So as I just mentioned, it hand, the SBA handles loans for homeowners, renters, and business owners. The types of loans they do are the business physical disaster loans. So if you have a business that was damaged and you need a loan to help rebuild or repair, they're there for that. Economic injury disaster loans, which is working capital for small businesses that are affected by a storm. Home disaster loans to homeowners, renters to repair or replace disaster damaged real estate and personal property. The other thing to also keep in mind with the SBA, if your loan request is under $25,000, that is an unsecured loan for them. You do not have to provide collateral. If your loan request is $25,000 or more, they are going to require collateral. I had that conversation with a representative from the SBA last week. Um, the other thing, and I'm guilty of this myself, you do not have to have your insurance paperwork or your contra uh, contractor estimates to apply for the SBA loan. You can give them estimates based on what you think it's going to be. But if you miss the November 19th deadline, that's over. So you will then have to go to a private lender. So you can go on ahead and go online and make your application and get this put together without having to have that documentation. You, that you could give it to them later, but the 19th, the November 19th deadline is critical. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Pittman to come up here as the president of the Baldwin County Home Builders, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about finding local contractors and some of the challenges our builders are facing just in the construction business right now. Thank, thank you, Eric. I, I guess I'm talking into the screen here. They don't. Hey, they don't need a lot. They don't leave a lot of meat on the bone. I think they've gone uh, over most everything. You know, I will say this. I came to Fairhope uh, after Frederick in 1979. In 1979, the commercial interest rates were 20 and 21 percent. If you want to buy a house, the lending rates were 14 and 15 percent. So consequently, you know, when, when Frederick hit and came through here, man, people were dying for work, and you could get somebody. Uh, They'd come out and look at your job, whatever you needed, and they'd be there tomorrow. Well, today, it, you know, it's totally opposite. Uh, the economy is great. Uh, lending rates for houses and stuff are two and a half, three percent. So, if, if I had one, if I had one word to say to, to, to describe what you need to do, it would be patience patience these people now you know everybody's busy uh, they're working hard you need to find you a good local builder that can can schedule your work and get you you know get you in line but it's not going to be overnight you, you need to find somebody you know this comp this competent and like I said they, they'll schedule your work and it may take three to four weeks, five to six weeks. But just, you know, be patient. As long as, you know, you're covered up, you're dry, just sit back and, you know, find, find you a good, good person. They, uh, I mean, you can, go, you can go to the Baldwin County Home Builder Association website. You can go to the, uh, the, the Alabama Home Builders Licensure Board website and find out, but if I had three things to tell you, it'd be this. Number one, if you talk to somebody, I would ask them, just like Eric said, do you, do you have a, a contractor's license? I need to see it. The next thing I would ask them would be, if we consummate a deal or I'd like you to look at it and see about doing my work, I need to get an insurance certificate for workman's comp and general liability. General liability will cover you in, in case of, you know, fraudulent work, bad work. Their insurance company will come back and take care of it. Work comp will take care of you. If they've got people working out on that job, 
somebody falls and breaks a leg, breaks an arm, then they can't come back on you, you know, to take care, you know, to, to, for, for their medical bills. The, the third thing I would say was, say, look, if you don't mind, just give me uh, three references of people I've worked for. You've worked for, I'm sorry, for the last two or three years and phone numbers and call them and ask them. I can tell you, if you'll take those three steps, I would dare say, man, you know, you got 95%, 99% chance it's gonna walk, you know, it's gonna all work out great. Now, you know, I'm gonna speak a little bit as far as material. You know, granted, it's supply and demand. This economy's on fire right now. You know, people are working, people are building. Material prices are up and they've been up. Of course, they're kind of they're kind of coming down now. But I think you know a, a, a portion of this is taken care of in your insurance estimate. These people are not going. These insurance companies aren't going to give an estimate with material prices from six months ago. I would dare say. Yeah, it's based on it's yeah. updated monthly. Yes, yeah, updated. You know, you know, monthly. Or if you're not happy, I think. Chris said, get, get their estimate and, and then call your builder or whoever you want to work with you and tell them you want an estimate. And then, you know, sit down with them and say, well, this is what my man wants. I think most of the time, you know, these insurance companies are, are relatively, uh, they want to please the customer. They, they, they don't want it broken off in them, nobody does, but I, but I guarantee you, I bet you if there's a little bit of difference and the difference is in your favor, they're, they're gonna let you use who you wanna use to satisfy you, get the claim closed, and you know, and just be through with it. So, I don't know, uh, I don't know what else to, you know, to say. Uh, Sounds like we have a lot of questions to answer. Well, that's good. Cliff, thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's nice to have someone. Cliff, appreciate that. It's nice to have a contractor's perspective because being, and he'll tell you, um, I kind of tend to be a police officer and not so much a citizen sometimes, so it's nice to, to hear from the contractors and know what they're facing because as everybody can see driving through town, we've got stuff being built everywhere and that happened way before the storm ever started. So it's just, it's just multiplied since the storm started. So Jessica is going to uh, read out some of the questions we have and it looks like we're getting a lot of comments on both the Facebook and YouTube page. Thank you very much. We're going to do our best to knowledgeably answer your questions and as many of them as we can. So she's going to read them out and then one of the three of us will come up and answer it. And I want to encourage you guys to kind of brevity, like brevity, sorry. Answer, but brevity because we do have a lot of questions to get to. Okay. Um, number one is uh, from YouTube and it's if we have to move out while repairs are happening, how do we claim loss of use and is there anything we should be aware of? Do you know the answer to that one? Okay. Uh, can we use those mics? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. So if you need to move out during that time, your insurance company, if you'll contact them and let them know, they'll awful, often assign someone to you who will um, specifically work with you and what it's called is um, additional living expenses because that's outside your normal um, everyday expenses. So usually they'll have someone assigned. If you call in and let them know, you know, especially if you've had a catastrophic damage, they've had somebody out, they're going to realize that's necessary. So that's commonly done. Okay. Okay. Roofing requirements. Who takes precedent? Is that Fairhope or Baldwin County? Uh, essentially, the Fairhope requirements and the Baldwin County requirements are the same. We've adopted the same codes. Now, one thing, Fairhope issues permits not only in the city limits, but also in our police jurisdiction. We go outside the city with our, with our building codes. There is a, a map on the city building department webpage that says permit jurisdiction map, so you'll know if you're in the county or the city. 
but essentially the requirements are the same and I've talked to my colleagues at other cities in the county and they're everybody's kind of taking the same line with the roofs Can I? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah uh, let, me, let me say something about this you know the requirements for the city and the county are such that whoever you pick or whoever you talk to about re-roofing your house if you don't tell them I want to re-roof this to be bronze, you know, certified, fortified. I mean, that, that's ludicrous. It's, it's only going. The, the only difference is, is probably paying somebody three hundred dollars to inspect it. I, I re-roofed my house year before last, and it probably cut my wind insurance by thirty-five percent. You know, I'll pay for that in two years, and that roof will be good for twenty-five years. Absolutely. And I see that uh, Kelly has a question on YouTube, and it looks like she's getting that answer in there. But just uh, for the sake of, of the question, can you endorse the check without having to get the mortgage company to endorse it? So a lot of times the mortgage company is included on the check once, well, different companies have different um, precedents on how they decide when the mortgage company is included. Many of the companies I've worked for have a limit of like, once it goes over 25000 they have to include the mortgage company on the check. Just because the mortgage company has a vested interest in the property. And what will happen a lot of times then is the mortgage company will actually set up an account that you can make draws out of. And what it does is it helps ensure that you're getting the work done and, you know, properly. And the contractor will actually have to submit documentation and maybe even some photos to help back up what they're doing. Okay, okay. Uh, next question. With so many residents having their fences knocked down from this storm, I find it disturbing that this is not covered under homeowner's insurance. Would FEMA be a financial aid with replacement? Okay, so, and I learned this the same way as everybody else. This is my first storm I've been through. I excluded, I was trying to get my policy down to where I could manage it, I excluded accessory structures. So that means the new roof that my shed needs and my uh, fences are not covered. That is specific to your policy and how you chose to set up your policy. FEMA, as far as disaster assistance, they are not going to help you with fences. That is, like, as I said, focused towards people that had catastrophic damage and need to find, need money immediately to live. SBA will help you with a loan if you have other things that need to be done in order to pay for those fences. But fences are specific to your insurance policy. I excluded them out of mine and I've got about 300 linear feet of fence I got to replace. Okay, next, next question. Uh, this homeowner had over $7,000 in Sally tree removal expenses and driveway damage to their property. The home it was, itself was not damaged. Uh, the homeowner applied to FEMA and they were reimbursed for $161.61. Um, are any of the excessive expenses reimbursable or act towards a property tax credit? Um, they are part of the Ferret Single Tax Corporation. Yeah, I can't really speak to the property tax credit. I, I, I don't know that, and, and I know Cliff is with single tax, but I don't think that has any impact on it one way or another. Um, the, the damages for trees, as I said, you know, FEMA is not going to cover that under disaster assistance. That's going to be something that's up to the homeowner or if it is a something that you had covered in your policy, Chris, unless you know something different. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this homeowner's fortified home was built in 2015 and it was damaged during Sally. The check received from the insurance company does not cover the cost to repair the home. Um, the lowest quote is two times more than the check that they received. They have not cashed the check that they have in hand. What should the homeowner do next? Uh, as Chris mentioned, cash the check. <laughs> yeah, first thing you want to do is definitely cash the check and get it in the bank. Then you need to get several estimates from local contractors and get that submitted in because a lot of times, you know, there's different scenarios. They may have not seen all the damages or so forth, so you want to come back, you know, get at least two estimates and send those into your insurance company and then they'll have something to look at. The other thing I'll tell you is one of the SBA representatives that I spoke to, they said their job is to help make you whole after a storm. If you have $30,000 worth of damage and you get insurance offer of $15,000, they're there to help make you whole as you were before the storm. So there's going to be deductibles in that. There's going to be any kind of uncovered items such as fences or sheds. That's what the SBA is there for. 
and that's where they're going to defer you when you go to FEMA to apply at the disaster assistance site. This homeowner had roof damage from Sally. They have insurance and submitted a claim and they were advised that there would be no settlement because the deductible is more than they value the claim. Um, they have had a roof installed and am asking the insurance, or they are asking the insurance company to review the claim but have not received a final answer. They have also submitted a FEMA application and the response they received was assistance not approved. Um, they've also submitted an application to SBA and they were approved for a loan. Uh, the question, I, they recently heard that people in the same situation um, have been able to get FEMA to pay some or all of their high deductible amounts. How can they pursue this with FEMA and possibly get assistance? Well, the only way that you're going to, you can make the application to the site. I made the application for disaster assistance right after the storm and I got a denial back three hours later. But they also sent me a link immediately to the SBA. So that goes back to what we were talking about. Chris? And one, of, one thing I'd like to say is you do want to let your insurance company know that you've had that roof installed because they also, a lot of times, different companies will prorate your roof. After a certain age, then they're going to prorate it, rate it. And some companies, even the policy will switch from RCV to ACV. Which Explain what RCV and ACV so are. RCV is recover, recoverable cost. And then ACV is actual cash value. So you want to let them know that you've had a new roof put on so that they can have it in their files, you know, so they can keep up with the age of it as well. Okay. okay so Target Addict over on YouTube um, has asked a question. Uh, they need help finding a local contractor who can provide a quote. They've had six come out so far since September the 23rd, and they've received zero quotes so far. Uh, so what is the... What's the magic formula, Cliff? <laughs> I, I wish I, you know, I wish I could tell you the magic formula. There again, I think part of it is patience and just just keep looking, or you know, ask your friends. You know, word of mouth is the best thing in the world as far as finding somebody you know reputable. And uh, you know, that's another thought here when I, you know, Eric was telling you all the requirements, what the city requires for permitting and, and, and this and that and whatever. If you find you a licensed contractor, the requirements are the least of your worries. That's the least of your problem. That's what you hire a licensed builder to do is represent you. The, the licensed builder is going to go down and he's going to talk to Eric. He's going to go to the building department, find out what do I need to do. You know what's right, what's wrong, what are you going to require? You don't, you don't need to be doing with that. You know, dealing with that. That's that's what I say. That's why you find somebody that's going to represent you and take care of you. You know, and get your house fixed, and uh, you know, you live happily ever after. I would hope. Sure. <laughs> Okay, Michael Cunningham over on YouTube is asking a question. Um, what are the deadlines for putting construction materials on the side of the road? Um, that's really a public works question, but I know Eric and I can, can talk to that. Yeah, um, and, and I don't know. It depends on where you are, and, and, and I, I'll speak on behalf of Richard Johnson on this one. Please understand that the city limits and the county maintained roads are really intertwined. So we've got some issues where the city has picked up or the county has picked up on one side of the road, city hasn't made it to the other side and vice versa. And so homeowners look across the street and say, well, their stuff's gone, why is, not, why is mine not? The plan is that they are gonna make three passes throughout the city. They're gonna do two hard passes and then another spot pass to pick up what's left. Um, the anticipation, if I remember and correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, he said it would be Thanksgiving or ish or somewhere after that before they anticipated they were done. It's a lot of material. It is, and we are firmly in the second pass, uh, the second hard pass cycle right now. I think we started that maybe about a week ago. So we've got at least another week or so um, of second hard pass. But again, the amount of debris is astronomical. It's, in, it's much higher than we expected when we began. Um, and I guess the short answer, sorry, Michael, it's taking us a while to get to that, is please put your construction materials on the side of the road as quickly as you as can. As quickly as you can, um, yeah. We, you know, th we're not going to be doing this forever. We're not going to be in the debris pickup uh, world forever. We're, our hope is to have everything taken care of, you know, before the holidays. <laughs> so, yes. So please put that out as quickly as you can. 
Um, okay, the damage to our home likely exceeds our insurance coverage. What federal relief from FEMA or otherwise is available to cover the loss that goes beyond our coverage and is federal relief income based? Federal relief, well, and I can't speak once again to the, the FEMA disaster assistance, but that will divert you to the SBA. I don't believe, and, and this, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is not income based. They're going to approve you based on need, based on what you have, what your, what your insurance quote was, and what the actual damage to your house is. But it is going to be, it's going to defer back to a small business administration loan to get the money to make you whole as you were before the storm came through. Uh, this homeowner would like to know where to go or what you do to file for assistance to replace food lost due to power outage for an extended period of time. Um, I, I can tell you because I had the same thing. I lost two freezers and two fridges. Uh, there is, if you Google FEMA stored food loss, uh, they do not cover losses of stored food. The only time that ever comes into play, if it's as a restaurant and then it, lo it lost stock, then they get into SBAs, but if, you know, unfortunately I'm the same way. I had to throw away two fridges and freezers full of food, but that's not something that FEMA is going to pay for. Uh, this is the, this homeowner's first time dealing with hurricanes. They had roof damage, sheetrock damage, and backdoor damage. They signed a contract with a local roofing company. Um, as the company stated, they needed to, they, they did what they needed to do to have the roof tarped from rain. Uh, the insurance company has requested that the homeowner send them the cost for the replacement claim on the roof, for replacing the door, and for the sheetrock work. The roofing company they have signed with states that they will give cash estimate but not a cost replacement for insurance. They are at an impasse and they state that, uh, and the roofing company states that the homeowner has a signed contract. What is their recourse to either get the roof replaced or get out of the contract so they can get another roofing company out to replace the roof? First and foremost, if they're doing roofing work, door work, and sheetrock work, verify they are a licensed home builder and not a roofer. If they are strictly a roofer, they cannot do that other work by law. So you need to go back to, uh, and I'm putting the slide back up. I don't know, Joe, if you can show them. Those are the two cards. The top card is the one you need for the unlimited license to do all that work. A roofer's license allows them to do roofs only period um, and if you would kind of re that's the first thing that caught my attention in that question would you recap that one more time so real quick? they uh, are trying to figure out their recourse to either get the roof replaced or get out of the contract so they can get another roofing company out to replace the roof and as far as signing contracts I I, I, I really don't want to try to answer that question that's a that's a legal question that I really don't think we need to get into because I don't know what the terms or conditions of that contract are um, the question I would have is, have they been paid anything? Do, have we paid them a deposit? If they haven't paid them a deposit, I'd, I would certainly consult with an attorney and find out about what your obligations are under that contract if no money is exchanged hands. Cliff? Yeah, well, hey, that's the reason you don't give any money down. I've been doing this for 41 years. I've never asked for a dime down. Any reptile builder is going to work in the rears. They're going to do the work and then bill you for the work, and you're going to be content with it, and you'll write them a check. If, 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 if they can't operate like that, you don't need to be dealing with them. Uh, and Karen is saying that um, no payment was made. So good. Okay. That, that okay. is a relief on our part. I, I would still suggest, though, that you, there's several uh, good land or uh, real estate attorneys in town. Make a phone call and just ask the question because I don't know how binding those contracts are, and a lot of it's going to be based on the language in that contract, whatever signed. And for our YouTube uh, viewers out there, we are dropping those slides, the JPEGs of these slides, in our Facebook comments where we have this, this video as well. But this will be available on uh, fairhopeal.gov. There's a Hurricane Sally tab, as Eric said earlier, and you can click on that. Um, so anyway, those are available both in Facebook comments and then again over on our website. One more thing in response to that. Yeah, I, I bet if you sat there and told them, said, well, let me, let me consult with my attorney, you probably hit, never hear another word from them. Or send them to the building department and let's see if we have a permit. <laughs> exactly. Okay, our final question tonight, uh, unless something comes in, 
is in addition to depreciation amounts, it appears material tax was also deducted from the RCV, and that was the replacement cost value. How is this fair to the homeowner to have to pay the material tax twice, once as a deduction of the replacement cost value from the insurance company, and once from the company who will replace the roof? Additionally, with regard to depreciation, are there set standards for percentage amounts throughout the insurance industry, or does each one set its own? So the the amount of the, that is held for your RCV depends by the company. Some companies will, I know one company in particular, their fences are all ACV. If you do a full run of fence, but if you do a repair, it is RCV. So it kind of depends on the company of how it's addressed. Uh, a lot of companies do contents as RCV, but they'll usually hold a good amount of the money until you actually go and buy the stuff and start replacing it. The, the other thing, and, and there's a lot of insurance questions, and, and we're really glad Chris is here with us to answer that. The other thing is, stay on top of your insurance agent. I, we all as homeowners pay a whole lot of money in insurance every year. We pay those folks. Don't be bashful about being direct and questions with your insurance agent if you have these questions they should be answering these for you that's what you pay them for as cliff mentioned with the contractors that's what we pay them for so don't be bashful about staying on top of them and also i would also say be a little bit patient like like us they're dealing with a whole lot of stuff right now so you know everybody and i know everybody wants to see work done i i would like to get a new roof and a new fence my dogs are going crazy but I, it, we're on the schedule. We'll get it when we get it. Um, you just, but don't also don't be don't sit back and let things just sit there without following up with your contractors, with your insurance company. If you have any questions about contractors you've talked to, you're welcome to call us at the building department. I cannot give recommendations, uh, but I can tell you if they're licensed or not. I can tell you if they've pulled permits in our jurisdiction before, because I can look them up by name. I can tell you how much work they do here. So we're here to help you in any way we possibly can. Our, our job is to protect your life, safety, health, and welfare, and after a natural disaster, that's where we really kick in with what we do. So you know, just be persistent with your contractors and with your, your insurance companies and with us if you need to be. If you call and leave a message, stay on us and we're, we're gonna call you back as quickly as we can. And it looks like that wraps us up for questions. Excellent. I just, I cannot thank you guys enough and Miss Jessica for putting all this together. Joe's in the back controlling the board. Uh, but Cliff, thank you for coming out, giving us a builder's perspective because we do need that. Chris, thank you for suggesting this. I mean, I think this has hopefully been useful to folks. I know, as far as I know, we're the only ones that have tried to do something like this. So, you know, please give us an A for effort because we're trying to make well, it happen. With all of the information out there and all the questions and all of this going on, and there's a lot of, what I was seeing, there's a lot of misinformation out there and people, you know, trying to answer questions that weren't for sure. So again, if you don't know, call your agent like you suggested or reach out to me you know there's a lot of good people you can reach out to or a contractor um, I know our numbers and stuff are listed so if anybody has any questions yeah and um, also I'm gonna ask Joe if you would that last slide gives the contact information for Chris uh, for the uh, Fairhope building department that's our main incoming uh, phone number and email and for the Baldwin County Home Builders Association and uh, that, that'll give you some resources to find contractors, to check on permits, check on contractors. Chris is available if, if you need help. Uh, he's said he's more than willing to help you too. Yes, ma'am. So uh, one last question, and I think that this contact card uh, answers it, but is there a website for homeowners to look up licensed contractors on? Yes, and yeah, there's, well, there's actually several. As we mentioned, there's the Home Builders Board site, General Contractors Board, Electrical Board, all of those, are listed on our city website. Um, I will go on ahead and I'm gonna ask when I come in on Monday or come in on Thursday to put this information from tonight on there. I'm gonna also ask Joe if he'll link over the licensing page that's on the city's building department website to the Sally page because I've got, I've got 
uh, links that you can go to for searches. I've got phone numbers and contacts. Um, so we'll, we'll try to provide that information for you so that you have the resources to find the people you need. Okay? Hey, and if I have one, oh, if I yes. have, if I have one word to say, patience. Patience. Be patient. That's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. Be patient, and it'll pay off in the long run, I yeah. can assure you. And be patient with your adjusters. They are really <laughs> overwhelmed right now. I mean, it's just amazing that, you know, the amount of work that we, that all of them have. So if you aren't getting an answer, give them a call, send them a message, you know, stay on top of them, but understand that they're pretty overloaded too. And so we're talking about patients. I'll throw the building department in there real quick. Um, I want to let you know, uh, I came in the other day and Gina and Cindy and Martha threw a stack of papers on my desk and it was 29 re-roofing applications they had received that day. We are processing those in 24 to 48 hours. We're getting them turned around and right back out the door, okay? But, uh, and we're getting those done because the one thing I do not want is a torn up roof that we have a chance to get it dry and get those people safe. So we are getting those done as quickly as possible. Um, but yeah, as, as Cliff mentioned, patience with every, patience with the debris pickup. It's a lot of material. We got a lot of people working hard. It was just a very difficult thing that we all came through. Um, so now's the cleanup time and we're going to pull together and work together on it and, and work together as insurance adjusters and contractors in the city to get everybody back to where we were. And I think we're all hoping and planning for a much better 2021 than we have had 2020. And hey, I'll say this again, you know, patience, Eric, let me know. You get a lot more with sugar than you do with salt. <laughs> I'm sure I'll <laughs> never live that down. <laughs> Thank you. Eric. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Most important, date. Most important date. If you didn't hear anything else, November 19, go to the SBA website and get your application in. And once again, you do not have to have a contractor estimate or an insurance settlement to make that application. You can estimate the cost of your damage. What they'll do is they'll set up your account, they'll approve or deny but typically approve your application and then they're going to come and send a representative to your house to come and inspect it. I actually have an inspection later this week on mine. They'll come and inspect and verify everything I put in my SBA application is legitimate. The one thing that they don't want to do, they're not going to pay twice so they are going to want to see your insurance information when they get it. but. That deadline is a hard deadline. We have got to, be, got to have your paperwork in by November 19th, or you are going to be on your own with a private lender to get your loans. Okay? Eric, what about the number for if they run across somebody that isn't licensed? Mm -hmm. Isn't there a number they can uh, call for the state or call you to report that? They can. They can, they can call and report it to us. Uh, there's also the Home Builders Licensure Board has investigators, and I will let you know I have had compliance officers from the GC Board, the Home Builders Board, the Electrical Board, the Plumbing Board, the HVAC Board, all down here. They are loving Baldwin County right now because they are basically living down here. So we have got compliance officers coming out of our ears, which is a wonderful thing. They are calling me, asking about permits and contractors, and it's a good thing. So. You can report it to the state website or you can call the city of Fairhope. If we have an unlicensed builder in our area, we want to know about it because we're going to go have a conversation with them. So once again, thank you to everybody. Jessica, thank you for putting this all together. That's awesome. It was good. And thank you guys for, for doing it. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to call us. We're here to, to help you. Okay. And everybody have a good night and have a good Veterans Day holiday. Thank you also to all of our veterans for tomorrow and thank you for your service and hope everybody has a restful day and a great rest of the week.